There's USB sticks floating around. There's a couple of them right up here. It's just six little files. They're not very big. They're just samples. They're the samples. Last time I did a presentation, I had a request for the trace files, so there you go. And since I do have a couple people that have been pre in previous classes, um, I guess this is where I will say gotcha. What's that? USB sticks in a parking lot, right? What could possibly go wrong with a free USB stick? You all just loaded them, right? Is this where I tell you that I'm not a good guy? <laughs> Trust me, I used to work for the government. I'm here to help. <laughs> yeah. No, this is a favorite pen testing trick. I didn't invent it by any means. I just used the heck out of it. And what could possibly be dangerous about a USB stick? This is actually going to lead into the first case file. So what could be dangerous about a USB stick? A USB stick is nothing more than a hard drive. It's just in a different form, correct? Different shape. A hard drive has something called track zero. Back in the 1980s, we had these things called boot sector viruses. Okay? Is just because it was 30 years ago mean it won't work now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what's old is new again. So... Picture this, and the, I, I've been teaching with the Dutch police for a couple years, and they've taught me some key words to use. Those words are hypothetically speaking. Because <laughs> the first class, the first day of class, I started into an example, and they said, the guy stopped me, and he said, you, you, you realize you're in a classroom full of police officers, and anything you say can be used against you. And I'm like, oops. So he says, uh, hypothetically speaking, so hypothetically speaking, could someone construct a script file that would record any character strings that start with the letters P-A-S-S -S or U-S-E-R, as in password and login? Is that possible? You've got a number of programmers in here. It's only a couple of keystrokes to write that script. And could one then, hypothetically speaking, load it on a USB stick? and collect people's credentials. So how we use this trick in pen testing, we do create those scripts. We load them on to USB sticks, we go to the employee parking lot the night before the pen test, and we scatter a dozen or so USB sticks around the parking lot. Because people always like free things, right? And the reason this one really is effective is Every, does, does everybody here have some kind of security software? Lie to me and say yes. Yeah. Okay. Then how come nobody picked up anything off of those sticks? There's one file that could possibly trip an antivirus scanner. The reason is every commercial antivirus product out there by default does not read the media before it pulls up the table, the, the file table of what's on that media. You can set your software to do that. So why on earth wouldn't they do it by default? Why would they not scan the USB sticks by default? Because it takes a whole extra 20 seconds and everybody wants everything fast, don't they? I see a couple people typing on their keyboards. How many people are now looking for that feature in their software? I recommend that you look it up. But the sticks, well, let's put it this way. The sticks were safe when I put them on the table. <laughs> what they may have picked up on someone else's computer, I'm not responsible for that one. And by the way, what the script file does at, at midnight it's pre-programmed to email your credentials back to us. And then the next day we hand them in to their people with a video clip showing their own people picking up the sticks and walking in the building. So most pen tests, they, the target usually fails the first morning. They just don't realize it. 
And this has just been in the news. I saw this recently. This, this trick was in the news. It's like, come on, man, we've done it for 15 years. All right. Does that satisfy those of you that wanted the horror show? Okay. Because you're right, normally the presentations I bring up are all of the horrible, nasty things that can happen. Because that's the area I work in. 30 years ago, I started out with Laura and Betty and the like. We all started out together in Sniffer University. So we still do tons of packets. I still teach troubleshooting classes. I was just in Germany a couple weeks ago with a, a company troubleshooting a video problem. But my main, my main area of focus is network forensics, which is nothing more than taking packet captures and asking different questions. Same stuff you guys do. All right, so as I said before, trust me, I'm here to help. I love that graphic, so I sneak it in anywhere I can. How many people recognize where that character is from? Long before Jim Carrey did The Grinch, the Grinch, there was an animated one on TV back in the 1960s, and that's where that's from. That's the one most people expect to see there, you know, the usual ransomware screen. All right, so here's the things we're going to look at. How many people have you heard of UPnP? What is it? plug and play, yes. And its intention is to make it easy, you plug something in, right? Well, guess what? That was the exact thing you used with the USB sticks, right? Detected hardware, accessed it, and read it. But did you know it's the number one security flaw in every operating system? Just completely idle security question. How many people here are using Windows? How many of you are using Macs? I saw a couple. How many are Linux? Okay. Which one's the most secure operating system? Windows. <laughs> Wouldn't be the one I picked. I'd have picked answer number four, none of the above. Windows gets beat up the worst because it's the one that most people use, right? Part of the reason is very simple. Go ahead and load the first file. Case study number one, it says baseline UPnP. Go ahead and load that one up. Now, one of the secrets I teach in rather troubleshooting forensics or whatever is how many people keep a baseline library? How many of you have samples of normal traffic? One, two, couple. All right, that's indispensable. For example, there are over 6,000 application protocols out there. Anybody here know how they all work? Don't look at me. I'm an old man. I don't remember that stuff. My secret is I keep sample libraries. Hence the name of that file, baseline UPnP. That is an example of a normal trace file because if you don't know what it looks like when it's working correctly, how are you going to troubleshoot it? How will you know for sure when it is not working correctly? So baseline or reference files, they go by different names. And here, and the, by the way, this presentation will be posted, is where to go to get some of the samples. The first choice there, look at it. Right there in the own Wireshark stuff. How many people have gone to wikiwireshark.org? Oh, man, the first thing I show my students on Monday morning is that website. If you haven't been to it, go to it. You're in for a pleasant surprise. Because everything you want to know about Wireshark, plus about two or 300 other tools, sits on that website. And one of the very things at the very top, it's like the third thing down, is an archive of about 300 hundred sample captures. Check it out. Good place to go. Some of these other ones down here towards the bottom, be a little careful. There's, there's some bad stuff on some of those websites. And the things we look for are very simple.
very simple things to think about. If you realize, if you stop and think, these are the same things you look for when you're troubleshooting, aren't they? But it comes back to my point. How do you know when something's strange if you don't know what it looks like correctly? For example, what port does HTTP run on? Port 80, TCP or UDP? TCP. What runs on UDP 1900? Well, actually, no. HTTP. How many people knew that? Ah. Oh. Guess what you would find out? Let me jump over to it. Take a look at that trace file. The one you, I had you just open. Look at the port numbers. What port numbers are they? UDP 1900. Open up the packets. I bet they're HTTP. And if you look inside the contents of the packets, what do you see? UPNP, plug and play. It's its own standard. They did this to us a couple years ago. Take a look at that. December 2008. And what is the intent of you plug and play? Make it easy. Yeah. Guess what the number one port in a pen test we go after? This one right here. Am I, am I working in the scary stuff? A little bit? You're getting there. Okay, cool. And to make it more fun, look at the address format. What's the lovely thing about multicasting in network? By the way, this is a layer three multicast. So we're talking IP, you know, 224 to 239. What do those do in networks? They go everywhere, don't they? Because the purpose of this is to discover other plug-and-play plug devices. And as you see in that trace file, I'll pull mine up, you have two primary commands, notify and search. So let's see. Here we go. So here's some notifies. This is where my machine is telling the world, hey, here I am. Not my, my UDP 1900 is open. And look at all of that information. What could possibly go wrong with your machine sending out a multicast to the entire network that you're there and your UDP 1900 is open? Could anything go wrong with that? Let's say I'm of questionable moral char character, and I'm perhaps sitting in the parking lot with my little Wi-Fi can antenna, you know, little Pringles can antenna, and I pick these up. Look at the information that's in there. Is that enough to cause some hate and discontent? It is, isn't it? And I'm, I'm sure everybody here has firewalls, correct? But 1900, I almost, almost guarantee you 100%. It's probably open. And an open port in a firewall is just like the firewall's not there, correct? Ten minutes ago, how many of you guys knew this existed? One. Well, two. Three. Well, you've been in one of my classes, so you know that one. That's, that's cheating. And if you look down a little bit further, there's other things happening in here. Here are searches where I'm now searching for other plug-and-play devices to connect to. Plug-and-play is one of my classic favorite examples of ease of use equals terrible security. This is intended to be ease of use, and it works. We all use plug-and-play, don't we? All the time, you know, you hook up your speakers, you hook up your microphone, you hook up whatever. Dead silence. I love it.
of it. What's that? Plug and play. Plug and pray. Yeah, okay, there we go. Yes, I like that. I like that. I may use that in another presentation. Plug and pray. Ah, okay, so let's step back slightly. I kind of got ahead of myself. My apologies. Question for you. How many of you guys have one of these? What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I picked up a couple of those in the Netherlands. One of my students brought them in. I said, what the heck are these? Oh, yeah. I've got the short-range glasses on. I'm sorry. Yeah, of course you know where they are. You brought them in. You brought in a pair of them. Yeah, my apologies. I'm sorry, guys. I've got my short-range glasses on for my computer screen. Like I said, I'm an old guy, so I can only see with, with these on. That's about it. Everybody else out there is a blur. All right. Uh, that Barbie doll. That caused a bit of a sensation here in Europe two years ago, didn't it? Why? What, what could possibly go wrong with a Barbie doll? Roland? Yep, and it was collecting, it was collecting information. And anybody have one of these? I, I, I don't have one because my wife says, oh, hell no, there's this thing called a vacuum cleaner. It's hand-powered. I just want one because I see all the cool cat videos of the cats sitting on the little rumbos going around the room. But there was a couple of recent exploits that made the news about these things because there's now one that's Wi-Fi enabled. And um, surprise, surprise, it has no password and no encryption. Runs on 2.4 gigahertz. Gee, what could somebody do with that? Download the floor plan of your entire house from its memory bank? And if you're, say, a secure government installation that's trying to save bucks on a, on a janitor staff so you're using these things, I can get a whole floor plan of your secure facility. Well, you don't, you don't need to do that. If you buy the one from Xiaomi, that sends its own a perfect uh, sense of floor plan generated by itself. <laughs> What about anybody? Does anybody use the voice commands on their TVs? Nope. How many people have a TV made in Korea? Yeah, LG, Samsung, you know that one, right? Yeah, that, one, that one's from a couple of years ago. If you're using the voice commands, it's not just capturing your voice, it's capturing everything it hears. As soon as you turn that on, and it all goes back to Korea. So think of some of the things you may be doing when your TV's turned on and think about them going back to Korea. To be honest with you, I'm more scared of what the U.S. government will do with whatever thing. Well, hypothetically speaking, someone in a red shirt may, may teach a class periodically at the no such agency. <laughs> hypothetically speaking, and let me tell you about this. Again, hypothetically speaking, they are awesome at collecting data. You use a, if you use a mobile phone, they've got your data. But they suck at analyzing it because they rely primarily on computers to do the analysis. I walked in on the, my evil twin, walked in on the first day, gave them what I consider a basic, fundamental, simple trace and asked them to give me some information about it. And I had like 20 blank faces staring at me. And it was like, oh my God, I expected you guys to be teaching me. You know what government agency I'm more worried about? You're, you're German, correct? Norwegian. No, oh, Norwegian, okay, cool, cool. You guys have some good people. Train some of them through NATO. Ah, uh, the Dutch government. They have this cool gray building in Zudemir. 
Anybody know what that building is? Four letters, A-I-V-D. It's the Dutch Intelligence Service. They are better than any other government agency I've worked for, on the record or off the record, at collecting data. Because what news story was in the news back in March? Concerning our, our comrades? They were hacking into the video streams of CCTV cameras and watching the video, downloading the video from the Russians, from inside Russian embassies. That's a pretty cool trick, isn't it? Yeah. And unfortunately, somebody leaked it to the American news, and the American news promptly went public with it. And some angry emails started showing up in email boxes going, do you know anything about this? And I'm like, no, not a clue. What are you talking about? And I turn on the news, and there it is right there on the news, and suddenly all the IP cameras went dead. All those cameras that for like a year and a half, they were pulling all this data and running it through facial recognition, all of them suddenly got switched off for some mysterious reason. Yeah. The two best countries in cyber war, well, three if you count the Netherlands, are probably South Korea, Israel, and I put the Netherlands about number three. I put the U.S. at about number ten. All kidding aside. The Russians would be roughly on par with the U.S. They're not as good as the press makes them out to be. The Chinese army I would put higher simply because they have manpower on their side. They will throw raw manpower at a problem. I mean, they got 20% of the world's population. So they, just, they sometimes just overwhelm you by sheer numbers in cyber war. North Koreans I'd put up at number four. I know what we all think about North Korea, but cyber-wise, they're good. They are good. All right, so does everybody at least recognize these devices? Most of them? These are just some examples I pulled off online. By the way, the teddy bear down there does the same thing the Barbie doll did. That was last Christmas's hot toy, at least in the States. It was supposed to be interactive with your child. You know, it, it wasn't just the same things over and over again. So, when we're talking about IoT, years ago they called a small office home office. So you still sometimes see Soho. These are a few of the Internet of Things technologies. You probably recognize a few of them. And what just... Briefly, what's our big problem with the Internet of Things? I mean, why are we here? Why are we here to, right now? Besides to watch the show. It's everywhere, isn't it? I'm pretty sure everybody here uses Bluetooth. True? Yeah. Um, anybody using those cool light bulbs that you can change the colors on with your cell phone. Yeah. Those are really cool. Yeah, made by Philips. Which ones do you use? Ikea. Ikea. I wonder where they get them from. <laughs> yeah, it turns out there's two versions of the Philips, the Philips software that most third-party people just license it, change the name on it. We're going to look at both of them. I, got, I have a capture of both of them. And uh, the first one was taken by a police guy. He was in one of the classes, and he went home that night and collected the data, and we brought it back, and we were, like, looking at it going, oh, my God, there's personal data in the light bulb traffic. The light bulb. Oh, <laughs> Wait till I show you the Amazon solution. In the States, we have these, thing, these people we call porch pirates. Have you heard that term, porch pirate? Yeah, they're the guys that follow the delivery trucks, especially around Christmas time, and right after the guy drops them off on your porch, they run up and grab the box. Yeah, Amazon came up with a wonderful solution for that. I'll, I'll show you guys. That's one of the case studies, actually. And then Home RF, Z-Wave, WiMAX, 
you've heard of all of these Zigbee. Zigbee's popular over here. Um, so plug and play, we, already, we, we looked at that one briefly. So I tell you what, let's take a look at Bluetooth. So open up the file, Bluetooth HCI. Go ahead and open up that one. I'll give you guys a minute to do that. I mean, Bluetooth, everybody knows the story on it. But how many people know that Bluetooth is actually its own standard? It's not just a marketing thing. 802.15, IEEE. And most of us use it for like headsets and things like that. But there's actually a standard for Bluetooth networking. And even high power networking connecting buildings together. If you can imagine that. Yeah. So it gets, it gets kind of interesting when you start looking at this kind of stuff. Now, Bluetooth runs in the same frequency as your regular 802.11, but it does it using a different technology. The technology they use is called Frequency Hopping Spread Spectrum, or FHSS, and basically what it means is the Bluetooth signal's constantly moving back and forth, as opposed to access points that a lot of them use, OFDM or DSSS. Uh, now, I totally agree with everybody. Originally, it was made for things like headsets. By the way, how many of you have Bluetooth turned on on your phones right now? I'll ask that question in five more minutes, and I bet I'll get no answers then. <laughs> Most of us keep it turned off because it sucks your battery down, doesn't it? Yeah, always turned off. Always turned off. So same here. Unless I need it, that sucker's turned off. Yeah. All right, cool. So let's, let's have some fun here. Let's have some fun. So Bluetooth works off of two different architectures. One's called a PicoNet, one's called a ScatterNet. Because Bluetooth devices are actually set up to find other Bluetooth devices. Think about your headset. When you first turn it on, you have to hit the little button, right, to make it connect to the phone. What does that little button cause it to do? Why do you have to push that button? Yeah, because of the hopping. There are 22 different hopping patterns. You're telling your headset, find, in this case, the phone, and they synchronize together to pick out a hopping pattern. Which one to use? That's what you're doing. You're initializing the connection. What you're doing is you're setting up a master and a slave. The headset and your phone form your PicoNet. But it turns out in Bluetooth, buried in the specifications, is the ability to connect multiple PicoNets into what's called a ScatterNet. This is where the Bluetooth networking comes into play. And I don't see it marketed very much, but every once in a while I'll come across somebody selling Bluetooth networking equipment. It does exist. And it's all there in the standards. It just really hasn't caught on very much until Internet of Things came along. Then it got a whole new life. You just think about it. It's low power, small form factor, which makes it perfect. And it's an established technology. There's nothing new about Bluetooth. There's no secret bugs to it or anything. So it's suddenly got a new lease of life, and we're seeing these scatter nets happening now. So, in that Bluetooth PCAP, it's a pretty large one, actually. Let me flip mine open here. So, what you're looking at here, the first 20 or so packets are nothing more than the units negotiating. They're negotiating their connection. And so, if, I want you guys to take a look, for example, at packet number one. This is where it's it's sending out its information. So I'll, I'll pull that one up for you full screen. So take a look at this. I mean, most people have never seen this information before. Now, unfortunately, this isn't a wireless class. We're not gonna have, we're not gonna have time to go through what all the fields mean. But what I want you to get, a, what the idea I want you to get in your head right now is, is that encrypted? No. Now, there is a mode of encryption in Bluetooth. 
you can use. It has kind of like, it's roughly kind of like an SSH type encryption, so it's not very robust. But it's not usually enabled by default. You have to use like third-party software to run it. Uh, I didn't bring it down. I have a device called an Adafruit. There's an Adafruit and a Bluefruit. They're just little USB capture, and they're just FHSS capture tools. Oh, well, I, was, I didn't want to talk about that one, but yes, the one by Hack5. That's Ubertooth, yeah, similar. Um, not with the blue, not with the blue fruit. It just simply, it's a passive collection device. It scans the Bluetooth patterns. Yes, normally that, that again, the synchronization that's actually in this trace, that's about the first 30 packets is the synchronization happening. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the different tools are made for different functions. I even have one on my cell phone that will capture Bluetooth data flowing to and from my cell phone. I don't like that one, though, because it doesn't display the Bluetooth headers. It just displays the payloads. It puts those pseudo payloads, kind of like capturing Wi-Fi on a Windows machine. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to, if you, uh, I, I'll have it down at the booth tomorrow. I'll bring my pouch of Wi-Fi toys down tomorrow. And they're, yeah. But there you go. I mean, nothing, nothing fancy. I was actually surprised um, that, that it worked, and it worked so smoothly. So you see here, you can see, for example, they're setting features. They're negotiating. And if you look at the times, this is all happening very, very quickly. It's a handful of seconds. So we're not talking a very long time. About four and a half, five seconds, and the connection is set up. Now, where this comes into play for us, and here's why I was telling you guys to turn off your, uh, your stuff. How many people have those wristbands, the Fitbits? One? Oh, come on. Nobody else? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah, two. Does anybody have the bathroom scale? This was the picture that freaked that guy out because he's got that scale. You got one? Well, cool. Take a look at what it's giving away, man. <laughs> Makes a good frisbee, a one-way frisbee. It won't come back. Well, okay, there you go. Yeah, that 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 one I agree with more. Yes, definitely. But I mean, again, and does that look encrypted? Now, I'm, I'm deliberately not showing the personal information in this trace file, and I didn't give you guys this trace file. I mean, I'm in the land of GPDR now. I've had to really rethink some of my files because there's potentially, oh, the last thing on earth I need is somebody in the audience to go, that's me! <laughs> then you would see how fast I can hobble for the door. So yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately not showing you information, but you can see here that it's being done over basic HTTP. It's internet level traffic. The IPs are going external. They're going out to the world. And it's all in plain text. Yeah, that's kind of a bad combination of things, isn't it? Yeah. And people are paying to give this information away. For those of you with the Fitbits, there was a cool story about a year ago that hit the news. What happened? What happened to the military? Military forces all over the world suddenly were told, get rid of Fitbits. The jogging patterns, yeah. And in Fitbit's defense, they had anonymized the data. There was no personal information there. It's just when you went to the website, 
they displayed three years' worth of data, including the GeoIP, the geolocation information. And while you know, the, the, the database that they made available to the public didn't say U.S. Special Forces secret base, when you see the same pattern by 200 people every morning, and when you go to Google Satellite and that area is pixelated out and you can't look at it, I mean, it doesn't, it's not rocket science to put one and one together and you get two and possibly visit by the NSA to your door wanting to know why you're searching that location on satellite view. Yeah, it, it was really bad. And it didn't hit just the U.S. It hit military all over the world. And quite a few supposedly secret places were given away by Fitbits. So now I know in the U.S. military, I know for a fact they've been outlawed on base. They're not allowed. Not something that anybody thought about in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Now, here comes the fear part. We have our friends, the Germans, to thank for this. It's one of the first two Bluetooth exploits. This one goes all the way back to 04. It's called Bluebug. There are databases online that if I can identify the model number of your phone, I simply go to that database and it will, it will have the instructions on how to compromise that phone and turn on the Bluetooth. How could that help me? Correct, yeah. I could, this is a favorite trick in industrial espionage. I'm a competitor of you. I want to listen in on your meetings. I can't get through the front door. How about I sit in your parking lot with a Bluetooth scanner? And if I find the phone and I can hijack it, I can turn on the speaker, just like I'm sitting in the meeting. Kind of cool. give access to all your SMS and then all, all of that kind of stuff. How are we doing for time, by the way? Oh, cool. Okay, we're, go we're doing good. And then we have my favorite one. I love this one. What's that guy holding there? Yeah, I've had a lot of people tell me it's a Star Wars blaster, and I'm like, <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. It's a Yagi antenna. And what's a Yagi antenna? High gain, directional. Well, actually, technically, it's a semi directional antenna. There's actually omnidirectional, 360, semi directional, which are a specified beam width, and then you got the directional ones that only go for a very narrow beam width. Technically, a Yagi is semi directional, but at this point, who really cares? All I care about is it's pumping 14 dB worth of gain into that signal. And if you know your RF math, 14 dB is a lot of horsepower. That is a lot. This guy was hacking Bluetooth from two kilometers away. He doesn't even need line of sight. Now, everybody in the world will tell you Bluetooth, you know, three meters maybe. Who the heck worries about somebody two kilometers away? There's a semi-famous lady. I can't figure out what she's famous for other than being famous. Uh, you heard the name Paris Hilton? And about 10 years ago, her, her phone got hacked, and it was this big, big story that all of these pictures that nobody should ever keep on their phone went public. Well, you're looking at a couple of the G-rated ones right off of her phone. This was the guy that hacked her. And I took this picture right off of his Facebook page. And I mean, look at the story. Look at the date there, August 2004. And again, it relies on the fact that the initial connection when you're synchronizing is not encrypted. It's not protected. So if he can synchronize to your phone, your phone thinks it's established a valid connection. At that point, does it matter if you're using encryption? He 
he's got you. Now that does underlie a fundamental flaw in the internet. How do we do, how do we apply security to our traffic? We throw it on on top at layer seven with SSL, TLSV, you know, pick your, pick your encryption, right? Trust. Yeah, the internet was built on trust. Matter of fact, if you go back in the RFCs and look, the first time somebody illegally hacked into the ARPANET, before it was even internet, was such a shock to all of them, they wrote an RFC about it. Why would anybody hack into something that was free? All you had to do was get a login. Now, when we came to Wi-Fi, we did it a little bit better. We threw encryption in at about layer three. But, Richard, is Wi-Fi encryption terribly secure? <laughs> he's, he, by the way, he's one of our, the Wi-Fi guys. He does the, a lot of the Wi-Fi stuff inside Wireshark. Yeah, I mean, we just came out with WPA3, right? You guys have heard of that? Please, please tell me you have. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, we're secure now, right? Uh, go to Google sometime, type WPA3 exploits. Every time we come out with some new security, that's like throwing raw meat into a shark tank. There are various and sundry people out there that will look at it and say, challenge accepted and come up with attempts to work around it. I mean, WPA3 definitely is better than doing it unencrypted. But, you know, roll the dice. This is a favorite one. I've had, oh, easily three or four cases where the evidence showed that the way the company lost their data was this technique right here. So this isn't an isolated thing. And yeah, 2004 is a long time ago, 14 years ago. This stuff still works. That Bluetooth capture you're looking at is only a couple years old. So Zigbee. Anybody here use Zigbee? Oh, I guarantee you, you do here in Europe. It's huge here in Europe. You may not know you're using it but you are, so go ahead and open up the file that says Zigbee Join Authenticate. By the way, Zigbee has its own IEEE specification as well. It's an offshoot of Bluetooth, 802.15.4 is the specification if you're interested in reading about it. So go ahead and open up that file. We'll talk briefly here about Zigbee. It uses a type of wireless... Uh, called OFDM, Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing, uh, which kind of came into existence right around BG OFDM. It's just another way of doing your channels and your, your frequencies. Um, it has multiple data rates, but I want you to look at the frequency bands. We're all so used to being programmed 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Yeah, this one gets down depending on where you are in the world. Now, I've got a, I've got a chart I use in, the wire, in a wireless class that shows all the different frequency bands because they do vary by, by region. Um, but the point is, most of us never look at these frequencies. We're busy looking at 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Um, very, very short range. Very, very short range. We're talking less than a milliwatt radiated power. Anybody use any of those? If you do, you guess what you're using? Zigbee. They work off of Zigbee. Uh, Nest is getting really big in the States. Uh, a friend of ours lives over in Horn in the Holland. The other day we were there, they had the, their second child had a birthday party, so we were invited along. We're sitting there right by the kitchen, and I look right up on the wall, and there's a Nest thermostat. And my, I, I pointed it out to my wife and said, that's cool. And you know what she said? Can you hack it? 
I'm in my friend's house, and she's telling me, hack it. And I'm like, I don't have any tools with me. And then, of course, he came over, and he says, well, have you hacked it yet? It's like my reputation precedes me or something, you know? Here's the floor show. Invite Phil. He'll hack your thermostat. Well, Zigbee, it turns out, as I said, it's an offshoot of Bluetooth. It uses the same architecture, the master-slave negotiations. It goes through the same synchronization sequences. They even can form it into networks, just like they can with Bluetooth. But unlike Bluetooth... Zigbee can operate in an unconnected environment. But the kicker to it is, it's always looking. It can operate like that. But what it wants is to get into that. So your Zigbee devices, your, your thermostats, your cameras, your light bulbs or whatever, are always looking for somebody to connect to. And unfortunately for us, There's not a lot of decryption, or encryption, rather. There's not a lot of encryption. Now, some of the vendors are starting to play with some encryption, but not much. So let's look at the packets here real quickly. So let's the Zigbee join. So here, what this is, this is a Zigbee, and it, I've, the data has been sanitized. So some of the information has been removed. So it, this one's free to hand out to anybody. This is a Zigbee device connecting up, locating and joining an existing Zigbee architecture. So if you're using any of the Nest equipment, the thermostats, the cameras, they make all kinds of things. They make door locks now. There's, uh, have you guys seen any of the IoT commercials? There's been a lot of them over here in Europe about Internet of Things. Yeah, let me see if I can get this to play. I got this one the other day. It's hysterical. There are times when using, uh, just because it's new, maybe it's not a good thing to use it for. Don't know how well this will play. Oh, of course, no, no audio. But there you see our, our guy using all of his high-tech stuff. Unfortunately, the projector doesn't have speakers, so there's no sound to this one. Everything's voice command, so it's nice and easy to use. And what could possibly go wrong? But it's just, it's great, isn't it? Now, my, my, my favorite one that shows Internet of Things vulnerabilities is a Dutch commercial. There's this big IT guy, his whole house is set up. He's, he's up on stage demoing how he can unlock the gate and unlock the door and turn on the stereo. Well, unfortunately for him, there's this team of crooks standing outside his gate trying to figure out how to get over this big tall wall that he's got surrounding his house then all of a sudden the gate opens and they're like okay through the gate they go then the front door of the house opens and into the house they go and they're like looking around there's all this artwork and everything and then suddenly this big 70 inch plasma tv comes up out of the stand and the next thing you see is they're snagging that as he's unlocking all of these features, they're just going through the house going, cool, man, the house has given us everything. And the big, the big finale of this guy's presentation is how he can open his garage and start his car from his cell phone. 
So the commercial ends, you see he's up on stage, and everybody's on their feet applauding this fantastic new technology, and you see the crooks driving off into the distance with the TV, the stereo, and everything piled up in this guy's like 200,000 euro sports car that he obligingly started for them. I love that one. Okay. So this is Zigbee operating normally, doing everything okay. But if you notice, you've got a couple of other files there. So I would like you to open Case Study 3A, Phillips Hue Trace. So go ahead and open that up. It's in one of the ones you've got. Very small file. It's only 26 packets. And this one was taken by my police friend. This is Philips Hue light bulbs version one, the original version. Look down in the payload. Notice again it's using that SSDP, short session description protocol. That's the workhorse for IoT and VoIP and video for that matter. Look for where you see the word dead beef. About halfway down the decode. Can everybody find that? That was the word we replaced his personal information with. We took a packet editing utility and just went into the packets and pulled his info out and he substituted the word dead beef. Now these are the light bulbs communicating to the base station which is what your phone communicates to. And it's Zigbee. Now, unfortunately for us, the device he was using to capture it changed the encapsulation. It put what are called pseudo-headers on it. So you don't see the actual Zigbee headers because he captured it with an app on his phone. He captured this traffic. That's why I gave you the other example where you can see the actual Zigbee. But again, notice it's all unencrypted. And everywhere you see in every one of these packets where you see the word dead beef, there was directly personal identifying information there from a light bulb. From a light bulb. Now the other one, you have another one in there called version 2. It should say case study. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, would that be information pertaining to his account? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it was which again is enough information for somebody to do some unpleasant things. So yeah, take a look at Philips Hue Idle version 2. I just got my hands on these. Here, the information is in a slightly different format. They did take out some of the identifiable information, but again, notice it's going to an external IP it's using a multicast format, and once again, it's using our friend UDP port 1900 to carry its data. And as you scroll through this, there's actually a few packets in this trace. As you scroll through it, I haven't had a chance to clean it up very much. You can go ahead and grab a follow stream. Here, for example, might be some words in there you recognize. Quite a few of them, actually. Again, from your light bulbs. So let's see, we have Philips Electronic, Royal Philips Electronics. There's a website. Philips Hue Personal Wireless Lighting. Some model number information. And once again, it's all in plain text, isn't it? And yet their documentation claims that their version 2 software now uses SSL encryption. Did I give you guys an encryption key for your trace file? No. Yes. I have no idea. I have no idea why they're doing this. I think my personal suspicion is Data is the new currency of the internet, personal data. The data these things are collecting is obviously a value to somebody. 
even if it looks like harmless information. Because I'll, I'll be honest, the first time I saw that, I'm like, big deal. Um, well, I have a set of these sitting in my lab. I haven't gotten into them yet. I had all kinds of cool toys piled up in a stack to play with. Um, but according to the documentation, I don't see any way to turn this off. In the in the lovely little PDF that came with it. Yeah. Well, it it very much depends on which manufacturer you get. If Ada display is the world, you get this. Um, if you want to have a little bit more security off the bat, but I explicitly say a little bit, uh, IKEA would be the one to go because they, for whatever reason, decided not to open the protocol and uh, open to the world the protocol and don't transport the information. So they use a proprietary. No, they use the secret standard, but they don't use a gateway device. So ah. they keep it strictly in the house. Okay. The only thing is, if you buy their gateway, then it connects to the internet to see for firmware updates. But you can easily set in between the traffic and you see it just connects to see your firmware traffic, but it doesn't uh, submit the, uh, the uh, communication in regard to when you turn on the lights on and off. But Philips Hue does it all the time. So if you really want to do it, and if you really want to see, get your house displayed on the internet, you go with the Chinese manufacturer. Oh, I got some, some, some of that coming up. Yeah. Xiaomi is... I mean, you can install a live webcam on your house. It will be easier. For you. Do you know who owns that company? Uh, I Chinese. A, I think it's a subset of the Chinese military. Yep, right the Chinese army. You didn't know you joined the Chinese army if you bought any of that equipment, did you? Yeah, yeah um, that, uh, that's an excellent point. I, actually, we've got an Ikea down the street. I guess that would be something interesting to play with and find out. At least it's not harvesting easy to read data. Ah, uh, wow. So let me catch up the slides here. So we got into the Philips Hue. Good old follow stream. Pulling out serial numbers, model numbers. And then here's my favorite. This one was done in Paris here recently, just this past year. There were several well known Zigbee exploits that were released. And what they did is they put a little generator on a drone. It was playing out using Zigbee, playing the string that triggered the exploit. And basically the exploit, about all it could do is turn the lights on and off. They just started flying it down the street to see which buildings they could turn the lights on and off. Notice the logo. You can see the lights flipping on and off. It's, it, it, it's really hard to see, but it's it's the drone flying by the buildings. They just flew it down some streets in Paris and video recorded turning lights on and off. How about if I turned off all of the lights? Yeah, that's true. You could cause outages and knock off, knock systems out. Oh. He's thinking the right way. <laughs> so this one was an internationally published study. Zigbee, of course, uh, went, the Hughes people went nuts. And, uh, but when all the, the uproar died away, the vulnerability still hasn't been fixed. Yeah, the things you can do with drones. So, here we go. The one my wife wanted me to hack. The Nest devices. So go ahead and uh, open up the trace. Uh, 28 March, just Nest set up. And the architecture that that capture was made in was this architecture here. Now, you may not use any Nest equipment, 
but does by chance does anybody use any of the Wemo equipment? W E M O. Yeah, those are those cool things you see in the TV shows. You know, the guy's doing everything in his house, making coffee and stuff. Anybody got any of these? Those are Wemo. Another fancy name for Zigbee. And I just saw a new one that's got a little mechanical arm. It's a little thing you like plug in if you want to push a button. And it's got a little mechanical arm that'll flip up and down or in and out to turn a switch on. When this kind of stuff first started showing up, my wife was like, can we do those at home? And I'm like, no. And then after she started looking at some of this stuff, she's like, you're right. But one of my favorite, you guys know the show The Big Bang Theory? Know it or at least heard of it? One of my favorite episodes is when the guys hook up their, a light switch to the internet and they wait to see who on the internet is going to discover it. And then you know, suddenly you see the lights blinking on and off. And it cuts over to China. And there's two Chinese guys dressed just as nerdy as the Big Bang guys, 12,000 miles away. And they're going, wow, what a bunch of nerds. And they're busy flipping the lights on. And then the guys in the Big Bang discover their light switch and start flinging it back up and on. And they think that's really cool that they're turning each other's lights on and off. Yeah, these are some examples. I was actually, I, I, I dug these up during the previous presentation. I, I just sat there and did a quick search for Wemo plugs, and I found them at Belkin, on Amazon, every kind of form factor. Wouldn't these be cool? I mean, don't, don't you guys think it's cool when you watch that movie where the guy's got everything in his house automated? Just don't turn on the door lock to be voice activated like the guy in the previous video. Yeah. And I'll be honest, the geek part of me thinks this would be kind of cool to be sitting here in the audience and flip up, flip up the phone and turn the power off on my son. He's watching our house right now. Start messing with him. Of course, he's really good at this stuff too, so that might not end very well. Yeah, that's, that's a war I really don't want to start. So, let me pull up my trace. And this is where we're going to get into Amazon's solution for the porch pirates. And I want to see what you guys think of Amazon's solution. So again, here's what we're looking at. And if you look at the title of it, it does say something about number 54. Go down to packet 54. It's just a TCP SYN frame. At first glance, nothing looks special about it. Do a simple follow stream. And this is traffic I captured from a Nest thermostat in my lab. Now, in Nest defense, some of their traffic has a rudimentary encryption. But notice what you can see right there. Or what do you think this is here? MAC address, and there I have a model number. That doesn't look encrypted to me. I, I can't pick out too much more there. I mean, there's one or two other little tiny things here. So what could I do with that information? Hmm, I think I have a slide for that. Oh, nope, I cut it out. I was getting too many slides. What I did is I took that model number and looked it up online and found a parts list and a complete schematic diagram right there publicly available on the internet. They gave me the complete part list of all of the parts, including all the chips and everything inside that Nest thermostat. It gave me the diagram so I could essentially build my own. Does that sound like something you don't want people to know? If I can build my own and I can get the parts list, how difficult would it be to figure out vulnerabilities and exploits? <coughs> Build my own little set of tools. Yeah. Yeah, that was just, that was kind of a little bit scary. You know, Amazon started selling this service. By the way, here's a couple, again, I just did these. I looked them up the other night. Here's a couple of known flaws 
just for the Nest thermostats alone. These are a couple of publicly known flaws that haven't been fixed. So, good old Wemo. A couple more, couple more flaws there. You have the Wemo PCAP, but here you go. Here, Amazon, to counter, they came up with a couple of different ways to counter package theft. Uh, one was, and I, I like this one the best of them, they have set up these secure lockers in all sorts of locations, and you can actually have your package delivered to the secure locker, and then you get a, a one-time pin that will open only that locker. So that I, I thought that one was kind of cool. But here's the solution they tried to market and charge people a couple hundred dollars for. Read the slide and see what could possibly go wrong with this one. Are you going to let a delivery guy open your front door? And what, how it's supposed to work is when the guy scans the code on the barcode on your package, it turns on the camera. So according to them, you have a visual record of who it was that opened your front door. Which sounds pretty secure, doesn't it? How many of you want your front door opened by somebody when you're not home? Yeah, the driver may, be, may only put the package in the door, close the door, but in the meantime, can he check out all your stuff? Yeah, what happens if you have a little kid? A little kid goes out the door. How about a pet goes out the door? Well, it's a My son's previous dog was a Rottweiler German Shepherd Doberman mix which was an interesting sight. Picture the head of a German Shepherd and the tail of a German Shepherd on Doberman legs with the body of a Rottweiler. Yeah, very intimidating, but he was a wimp. <laughs> but all, all people would do, the mailman would hear him barking and immediately go to the end of the front porch. So he had about a 10-meter gap between him and the dog. And all it, took is, all it takes is one firecracker or a clap of thunder, and the dog was a quivering mass of jelly. But from outside the house, or when he, that head pokes through the curtain in the front window, you're intimidated. Yeah, so the day after Amazon released this product, in Wi-Fi, we have this thing called a deauthentication frame. Anybody know what that's used for? It's to terminate a connection, isn't it? And how difficult would it be to scan an unsecured IP camera and possibly get its MAC address? Well, let's see. It's a Wi-Fi camera, so that information is going to be going out over the air, correct? So what do you think would happen to the camera if you hit it with a flood of deauthentication frames? It crashes and burns, and it takes about 90 seconds to reboot. Again, what could possibly go wrong? You got 90 seconds in which the camera isn't recording who just went in your front door. So if a, you know, hypothetically speaking, one could create a tool, get a nice little Pringles antenna. By the way, I mean everybody always laughs at the Pringles can antennas. Why do they work so well with 2.4 gigahertz? They don't work with five, but they work great with 2.4. The diameter and the length. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the mylar inside. Yeah, in RF, the magic numbers for antennas are half wavelength and quarter wavelength of the signal. And it turns out, entirely by coincidence, because Pringles predates 802.11, uh, full size, it only works with the full size can, happens to be within a millimeter or two of a quarter wavelength of 2.4 gigahertz. Now, who, who looked at a Pringles can and said, ooh, I wonder? Whoever did probably was at one of the coffee shops in Amsterdam and had a munchie attack. If you don't get that reference, look it up online. You'll figure it out. What's that? There you go, 420. Yep. So... 
purely by coincidence, guess what we have some packets of? Now again, hypothetically speaking, these might call, one of these MAC addresses might correspond to a house three doors down the street that, again, hypothetically speaking, might have one of those Amazon cameras. And you know what? The front door unlocks. Again, hypothetically speaking. I'm not admitting to anything. But there you go. And generating a deauthentication packet, you talk to anybody that does anything with Wi-Fi, this is, a, a five-year-old could do this. It's not, this isn't difficult. Now, I like to throw this one in because this is an IoT case of inter Internet of Things terrorism. Well, here's a clue. Here's Phil's crime tip number one. Don't do something like this to the neighborhood cop because he's going to have friends, especially if he works on the cyber squad. This did not end well for the person that was doing it. This was a big case in the States. Among other things, he hacked into the child. Uh, for those of you that have babies, how many of you got a baby monitor to, to, to listen, at least listen in on the baby to hear if there's any trouble? Anybody got a baby camera? One of my business partners that's here with me, the last night he was showing me his daughter tucked into bed, sound asleep. Well, they couldn't figure out why the baby, like a one-year-old baby, would be waking up 2, 3 o'clock in the morning screaming. Not, I'm hungry, crying, but like screaming in fear. And then, so one night, Dad went in. They, they couldn't figure it out. Dad's sitting there, and about 3 o'clock in the morning, the baby monitor suddenly starts broadcasting all of these horrible things. The guy had hacked into the feed and was basically terrorizing their baby. And how would you react to that? Not terribly well, correct? The cop was on the cyber squad, got a couple of his buddies, a little bit of equipment. It didn't take long to figure out who it was. You can look this story up if you want. It's kind of great. This is the abbreviated version of it. Yeah, he kind of went, he did all kinds of stupid things. All right. Infrared. Anybody ever use infrared for anything? Anybody ever have one of the original Nintendos with the, 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 the wireless controller that was only good for about a meter and a half? It's because it was infrared. That's why when the dog walked between your controller and the Nintendo, you'd lose your connection. But infrared is actually part of the 802.11 specification. Not A, B, G, or N, but the original 802.11. And this, it is used. I had a student in another class that worked for a company that did translation services for diplomats. And the equipment they used was all infrared based. They would have emitters all around the room, and the little earpiece the guy had was an infrared link. Now, I didn't make this capture. A friend of mine made the capture you're about to see. And I just threw it in here. I threw it in here because most people have never seen the, pa the packets before. But there you go, 802.11. It actually has a surprising throughput. Theoretically, up to about 4 megabit. So your packet captures... Uh, do, 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 do. There we go. Infrared. And there you go. And again, the interesting thing in this, again, is you're going to see it's pretty much plain language. Again, no encryption. Obviously, my buddy's name. Anybody want to guess what my buddy's name is? Yeah. So I just threw this one in there. Uh, I'm not aware, really, of any 
hardcore exploits, but again, unencrypted, right out there, well documented. So I have no no question in my mind that there aren't aren't some things that could be done with this, manipulated. Now the interesting thing is, infrared networking is starting to gain ground in homes. Why? Why on earth would you want to go with a point-to-point line-of-sight linkage? Yeah. It doesn't, re- doesn't penetrate through your walls. I mean, a sheet of paper is enough to block infrared. Correct. Nobody can sit on the street and pick it up. Your Pringles can antenna won't do you any good. Might as well fill it back up with potato chips. Yeah. Plus, 2.4 and 5 is so overloaded. Everything in the world runs in the ISM bands, doesn't it? In the unibands. It's because they're unregulated. I mean, they're, they were set aside for people to play with. So this is starting to show up. They're starting to make equipment for home networking. <sighs> okay. Ah. For those of you that have been waiting, here we go. Here comes the scary stuff. Um, botnets. Now, what on earth do botnets have to do with the Internet of Things? This is normally a problem in companies and governments. How many of you have heard of Mire, which is Japanese for the future? Mire was very unusual because it was the first large botnet built on Internet of Things. IP cameras, TVs, baby monitors, and so forth. Yeah, and it was basically a prank, a college prank gone wrong. Now what this slide is showing here, this was a test done in New York. That's Manhattan, the island in New York. And they wanted to test how fast a simple worm would propagate over Wi-Fi. And it did nothing destructive. All it did when it infected the device, it sent out a single packet back to the creators to let them know the device was infected. 24 hours later, it erased itself. But look at the spread. That looks a lot like the spread of a disease, doesn't it? It's not by accident that we use terms like worm, virus, and so forth. And this was done from a single wireless device, the way it spread. I mean, look at the coverage after 24 hours. So, yes? Um, you know, I'd have to go back and look it up. I don't remember the details, unfortunately. I've got a copy of the white paper on my machine. I could pull it up. Yeah, it, it was just a very simple garden variety thing. I think that's my coffee cup. Yeah. That's yes, my coffee cup, all right. That's where it went. And remember, I used to work with nuclear weapons. (laughs) Would somebody hand me my coffee cup, please? It's decaf coffee, so it's of no use to anybody, other than it's it's a cool shark thing if you get a chance. My wife got it for me. Talks about sharks. It's not terribly politically correct, so I won't say it out loud. But here's what happened. And this, uh, just last week, one of the co-creators of this was sentenced to jail. It was just in the news. That's why I threw it in. Because the Mira is about a year and a half old now, two years old. But it was the first Internet of Things, and you have the capture. You have one of the Mira captures. You have one of the command and control traffic. So there's the basic mechanics of it. I mean, if you're familiar with bots and botnets, there was nothing really creative about Mira, the mechanisms. They were pretty garden variety. Um, but what they did... The guys that wrote this just went online and looked up model numbers, vendor model numbers, and the default passwords. And this thing, this is just one of the pieces of it. It was 
thousands and thousands of these devices, and as this worm crawled through the architecture, it would figure out the model number of the device and simply do a, a brute force using the known list of defaults. Have any of you guys ever looked up a default password for a piece of equipment online? Access points all the time, right? Here's a clue. If it says Cisco Tri Tsunami, you know, Japanese for tidal wave, that's their, Cisco's default password. So this thing built a huge botnet. Um, if you work in the security field, you quite possibly know a gentleman by the name of Krebs, Brian Krebs. His website is Krebs on Security. Ring a bell? He's, he's one of the best in the business. He, he has a lot of knowledge that the rest of us just kind of look at and go, wow, that's cool. Well, he unfortunately was one of the targets of this thing. He was actually forced off the internet for a while. So there's the packets, the command and control. And look at the protocol it uses. Telnet! Bet you haven't heard of that one in a while. That's the first protocol on the ARPANET. October 29th, 1969 is the first recorded host-to-host -host communication using Telnet. I believe it. I believe it. Because even though it's so ancient, we still use it today, don't we? <laughs> well, we use it because it's 50 years old and there's no secrets. There's nothing left undocumented about it. Yeah, I mean, if you have to get into a router or a switch and the GUI takes a dump, break out the serial cable, hyperterminal, and you're in, right? Well, here's a clue. Hyperterminal is just Telnet. Yeah. You can do that, too. Actually, a penetration technique is to doing Telnet to random port numbers. You know, there's, some, there's actually some cool tricks you can do with Telnet. So, I mean, that's, look at it. That's what it's using. You can, you can go through the trace file at your leisure and reconstruct stuff. But I want to show you that this one hit home personally. Mary hit home personally to yours truly. I use a piece of medical equipment called a CPAP machine. Sometimes when I'm sleeping, I stop breathing. And this machine pushes a stream of air in to kind of keep me on this plane of existence. I'm not in any hurry to check out the next dimension. And when I got my new one, that's me, that's my fingers. You can see I bite my fingernail. It had a little Wi-Fi adapter on the back. And I said, what's that? And he says, oh, that sends data to the doctor. And they gave me that picture. That's apparently the data it sends. And I'm like, gee, I don't know if I want this. And I said, what does he use it for? He says, well, he uses it to, to adjust your machine. Guess what went through my mind when, the, when the, guy, the sales rep is demonstrating how to use my machine and he got to where the doctor gets to adjust it over the, over the wireless. You can bet what my reaction was. See those fingers removing the module? Now here's, here's where it hit home. If you go back to that slide that shows those brute force passwords, my piece of equipment was in that list. Yeah, that could be a bad thing, couldn't it? What do you think happens to your body when too much air pressure gets pushed into it? You get air bubbles. Everybody's seen all the movies, right? The air bubble. It's true. The movies get it wrong, but the idea of a loose air bubble in your body isn't, doesn't end well. And anybody that's a diver knows about bubbles. Bubbles are not a good thing. Yeah. Um, another example. You're all familiar with pacemakers or insulin pumps. A lot of those are wireless now. Yeah. Guess where I'm going with this one. They're wireless so that if it has to be adjusted, the doctor doesn't have to cut you back open, which I, that, that's a good thing. You really don't want to have to go back in and get cut open and stitched back up again. But what could somebody do with that? 
Last year in Amsterdam, there was a murder. They think it was a murder, though. They can't prove it. Because the guy's pacemaker suddenly stopped. And he fell over dead. But when they took the pacemaker out of the body and sent it to the manufacturer, it was working perfectly. It was made by a well-known medical company that had been forced two years ago to publicly acknowledge a presentation at DEF CON in which the presentation revealed six exploits for that pacemaker model. Yeah. It's real. Suddenly, we're not talking about turning light bulbs on and off anymore, are we? We're screaming into baby monitors. But they can't prove it because there's no log file. Obviously, nobody was following around with Wireshark collecting his data. Yeah. Think about that if you know somebody with a pacemaker or an insulin pump or a piece of medical equipment. So now that, that little thing sits in my drawer. And when I took it, took it off, the, the guy looked at me and he says, well, the doctor won't be able to administer your equipment. And I'm like, well, how, how, what, what's the alternative? And he said, well, there's an SD card on the back, but you'll have to bring that into the doctor. And I'm like, where's the card? I said, I'll bring it to the doctor. So now when I go into the doctor, I take the little SD card, and he keeps reminding me I can hook this thing up to go give him information over the Internet. And I always pretend like this is the first time I heard it. And go, oh, really? Well, I'll have to check that out. Meanwhile, this thing's sitting in the bottom of one of my junk drawers. Yeah. Now, this is what Mary did. Again, nothing fancy, nothing unusual, just a good old-fashioned sin flood. But if you remember the statistics, imagine how many sin frames 14 million devices can generate. <coughs> Brian Krebs was the first target of Mire. The three college students that created Mire unfortunately lost control of it to another hacker who redirected it to a little company in the United States called Dyne. D-Y-N. Anybody heard that name? They knocked out the internet on a good portion of the United States. So for about a third of the United States, for about 24 hours, you had no internet because it targeted Dyne controls the root level DNS servers. And if you know anything about DNS, what happens when the root servers go down? You get no DNS. And how many of us have the IP addresses of our favorite websites memorized? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, I got them right here, man, you know. Yeah, host file. <laughs> Just like I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure everybody backs up their data all the time, right? Yeah. Mirai wasn't the only one. There's a few others, including this one, who's still growing. The Torre. I just heard about this one yesterday. And it's already at over 3 million nodes. These are all IoT. Oh, except the one for the Android phone. And the Twitter-based one. Yeah. Kind of fun, isn't it? I like the one named Reaper. That's the coolest one. And a little bit of humor there. Since it's that time of the year, we're getting into that time of the year. And one last question for you guys. International Space Station should be safe, right? It's got a nice air gap, 220 miles straight up. So do you think they're safe? Now that was the space shuttle. You might have remember that one. Yeah, somebody brought up an infected USB stick to the space station. Yeah, Houston, we have a problem. In this particular case, it caused a necessary piece of plumbing to work in reverse. 
I'll leave your, that to your imagination. Zero G. Yeah. Are there any questions? I know we're, we're out of time. I'm getting various. If not, there's some contact info. I, that's a completely separate discussion. Uh, that would be a completely separate one. Um, I will show you this again, and we're talking hypothetically speaking, since you brought it up. Um, are you guys familiar with Shodan, the Shodan search engine? Okay, there's a Shodan search from the breakfast table at Estoril last year. Remember those cool breakfast tables for those of you that were there? Yeah. So we did a Shodan search for, so for PLAs that were open to the Internet. The guy I was with was from Florida, so we picked a Florida one. Um, again, hypothetically speaking, someone might have used something that runs on port 23 to connect to said array and captured some data. Again, over the internet from the breakfast table. The key packet for this one is packet 120. Right click, follow TCP stream. What do you see there? Do you see a name by chance? Right there. Want to guess what that is? That just might be a password. By the way, it is. So just for giggles, I took that name. Evil Twin took that name. Looked it up on LinkedIn. Got a hit. She's the HR director for the company that controls Florida's power grid. Now, what on earth the HR director having access to, to PLAs in the power plants I have no idea how that access happened. That was from the freaking breakfast table. Nah. Yeah, pet you. I need to give you my business part card for consulting services, man. <laughs> Kerching. Yeah. The thing is, most industrial automation companies have no clue about network technologies whatsoever because it's not the same thing as industrial networks. Yep. It is a completely different separate thing. So when they talk about industrial IoT, what well, are the guys talk to? Are the sales guys? Are the clients? Yeah. The HR director? The HR director, maybe? Yeah. Anybody got one of these keyboards? Internet, if you're an internet gamer or hardcore, when you quite possibly do, because the keys are programmable. A friend of mine was playing around with Wireshark one day, and he saw some strange packets leaving his firewall. So he started tracing them back, and it turns out they come from this keyboard, which is a very popular keyboard on AliExpress. And look at that. There were key loggers found embedded in the firmware. It's a Chinese program called Green Tree. Basically, any product made in China has this embedded into its firmware. It allows the Chinese army to open a back door to that device. Now, why on earth you'd bug a keyboard, I don't know. That's an IoT device. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I have, I have an, uh, we'll, we'll, the last thing I want to show you guys, I do have to announce there's been a death. 
I'm sorry to report. Makes you think about all those emails you threw in your spam folder a little bit differently, doesn't it? Yeah, a friend of mine sent me that. Oh, and for you RJ45 guys, what's that? That's a microphone hidden inside the shield of your cable. Gets power right out of the wires, yeah. How many of you are now going to be checking your RJ45s? Because that was a store-bought cable. That's from a U.S. embassy in a country. So, thank you very much. <laughs>